online um so i'm currently reading i don't want to overwhelm myself i read two books at a time and i read at the pace of a snail i'm trying to get into reading again let's get it so every leftist communist socialist should be reading theory but like i prefer to and take that information via like audiobooks or speeches or lectures online. I don't like to read theory, I have to listen to it. That way I could like take notes and like process it more easily and it keeps my attention for longer when I listen to it rather than when I read it. So let me grab them. I have a bunch. Okay, so these are ones that I've read so far. Uh, Malcolm X, Afro-American History. Um, it's like a selection of his essays. And then you go a step farther. They get you again on this violence. They have another trap wherein they make it look criminal if any of us who has a rope around his neck or one is being put around his neck, if you do anything to stop the man from putting that rope around your neck, that's violence. And again, this bourgeois negro who's trying to be polite and respectable and all, he never wants to be identified with violence. So he lets them do anything to him, and he sits there submitting to it nonviolently, just so he can keep his image of responsibility. He dies with a responsible image. He dies with a polite image, but he dies. The man who is irresponsible and impolite, he keeps his life. That responsible Negro, he'll die every day. But if the irresponsible one dies, he takes some of those with him who are trying to make him die. That's a major point of neoliberalism. The modern um, Democratic Party that likes to pretend it's very uh, progressive will take this stance of moral superiority where they try to say if you are resisting fascism, racism, um, if you are defending yourself against uh, people who incite violence, then you're just as bad as them. Oh, you're being violent even if it's in self-defense? Oh, you're stooping to their level. Michelle Obama's bullshit line about when they go low, we go high, that doesn't work. That gets black people killed. Why would you want to treat your oppressor with nonviolence? It doesn't add up. I mean, if people are, like, if um, a police officer is about to murder a black person in cold blood, should the black person be glad that they were respectable and responsible and maintain this image of um, mor moral superiority because they didn't stoop to the police officer's level? No. America likes to demonize black people for self-defense because they know if black people were to uh, retaliate only one quarter of the violence that we face then this country wouldn't be standing and that's the direction it's going to because there is no institution that holds police accountable the department of justice doesn't do it certainly prosecutor camilla harris won't do it she literally worked with cops to put people in jail. I don't know why she's phrased as, uh, imagined as this progressive um, leader in the movement. So it's contradictory when you see white 
supremacists being violent and hurting black people, yet you want, you're want you concerned about black people being non-violent, why should we be non-violent? Black people have no reason to be non-violent, and if white people had to face the violence that black people do, it would be called terrorism. That's why they call it terrorism, because white people don't face hate crimes or prejudice or racism. They don't even have to deal with the consequences of it. But if they want to preach to black people about being nonviolent and um, being respectable and being a good house nigger, then they will have no problem uh, giving out lectures on how black people should respond to our oppression. Let's do another one. This is fun. Um, I haven't read this in a minute. It's the same way with you and me. Every contribution we make, we don't make it for our people. We make it for the man. We make it for our master. He gets the benefit from it. We die not for our people. We die for him. We don't die for our home, our house. We die for his house. We don't die for our country. We die for his country. So um, this is also geared to the, towards the neoliberal blacks who will say like um, they stand with Black Lives Matter uh, but they don't agree with burning the flag. Or they stand with Black Lives Matter but they don't want to uh, disrespect our troops. Um, the troops are a tool of imperialism. They aren't uh, keeping us safe. The main threat to black people is their own government. It's not the Chinese, <clears throat> the Russians, or the Cubans or any exterior threat. The greatest threat to black people inside America and outside of America is the United States because it coddles white supremacy. White supremacists will get um, a Burger King after they shoot up a church. They will get uh, sympathetic pieces written about them in the New York Times. They'll be rehumanized after they commit these atrocities. Uh, yet, if black people say that uh, Derek Chauvin deserves um, the treatment that black people have been getting for minor crimes, i.e. a Mattel. If we say that Derek Chauvin deserves the same treatment as Emmett Till, then we're the bad ones because we're wishing violence on another human being. I mean, these people don't even view us as equals, so why would I be at all concerned about their well-being? It's that neoliberal bullshit again about when they go low, we go high. Why do I want to go high when they're going low? That gets me killed. Malcolm X knew this. He warned us about the liberals who pose as progressive, who will infiltrate black movements and pan-Africanism and try to phrase it in a way that makes it comfortable. Uh, the revolution isn't about coddling racists or making them comfortable or making racist sympathizers comfortable or even having black-centered or black-centered capitalism. I don't want to see black CEOs. I want to see black people getting um, the equal treatment that we've been waiting for for 400 years and voting certainly won't get us that. Formally, when the just white nations had it, they went according to certain rules, rules laid down by them. They have always done this. They have always laid down the rules, but the rules are always in their favor. But they are have already learned through history that the dark nation that becomes truly independent intellectually doesn't necessarily go by their rules. The Japanese proved this when they hit Pearl Harbor. They smile and bop, let you have it. Well, this is true. And this goes beyond the ground rules that they laid down and it gets unexpected results. Now, since the Japanese proved their ability to do this with Pearl Harbor, which is intelligent in my opinion, I don't think that anybody should tell somebody else what they're going to do. They should go ahead and do it. And that's it. So, great book if you haven't um, looked at it. Then next I have a uh, Story of Black Power by Stokely Carmichael. Kwame now lives in the African nation, Guinea. But history knows him as a fiery young African American who led the Black, Pan Black Power movement in the 1960s. Stokely Carmichael. 
Freedom Rider, Voter Registration Worker, Chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. He urged African Americans to be self-reliant, reclaim their African heritage, and show black pride. His life was taking was taken a very different path from the one he imagined when he went off to college to become a doctor. Yeah. I, I should reread this one soon. It's another really good book. Um, and then To Die for the People by Huey P. Newton. So if things get worse for oppressed people, they will feel the need for revolution and resistance. The people make revolution. The oppressors, by their brutal actions, cause resistance by the people. Progress will always come from the ground up, not from the top down. Don't look for political leaders or anyone in office to have answers to uh, police genocide because uh, whether they're team red or team blue, they're going to vote for more police funding. It takes people pushed to their limits to start a revolution. Um, when they realize they have something to die for. American troops have nothing to die for. They die for propaganda that tells them that um, foreigners want to invade us and everyone hates us because we have freedom and our democracy is um, the top of the line and we are the uh, cornerstone of democracy for the world and we need to share it with everyone. And we do it through using our military. That's a line of BS. Um, American imperialism has always worked against nations of color, especially those who assert their own sovereignty um, over their trade, economics, welfare, education, um, even their funding. Uh, IMF, IMF's uh, predatory loans, I talked about that. Uh, not just America, but France, er, France, Belgium, uh, the United Kingdom, every colonial state finds a way to loot the global south of resources. Now when it all comes full circle, uh, there's going to be hell to pay for um, Western countries who for so long set a certain set of rules for themselves and then everyone else um, it doesn't apply to. So minimum wage in America is very low, extremely low compared to other developed nations, aka Western nations. Um, but we're lacking at healthcare. We have the largest prison system in the world, yet we're the most free. Um, if you ask yourself how that's possible, it's because black people aren't viewed as part of the population. So if black people are incarcerated, then that doesn't um, hinder our freedom. It just means that white people feel more safe because they don't have to worry about, um, how did Joe Biden put it? A desegregated jungle? Yeah. So now on to historical, on to historical fiction. So uh, yeah, those are like my books of theory that I have. They're mainly just essays. Um, so they're like really easy to read. But for all my other theory, I listen to it because all my other theory I listen to just because that's like the most enjoyable for me. Um, let me know in your reading down below. Oh, so starting with the ones that... These are books that I started, but I haven't finished. A Little Life by Hanya Yengadahara. Um, so it's about like four classmates and it follows them from college I think until they're like mid 40s. Um, it's extremely sad. If you um, trigger warning uh, for abuse and sexual violence, um, I had to take a break from it. I'm almost halfway done. Hopefully I'm gonna pick this up soon and finish it because I really like it. It was just, it was a little too much. Um, and yeah, it got me in my feels. And it's like extremely upsetting, but really well really well written. A Little Life, I will recommend. Um, but content warning it has a lot of abuse and sexual violence. 
Haven't started this yet. Beware of Pity by Stefan Zweig. After Thomas Mann, Stefan Zweig is perhaps the most well-known and widely read author writing in German for the Nazi rule. Beware of Pity was written by Zweig's London in Zweig's London Exile in 1938. Although it is above all a psychological novel whose tragedy unfolds in the private realms, Zweig's humanistic perspective provides a commentary on the larger historical and political situation. His subtle analysis of pity and its implications is a his psychological study of the self-denying surrender to the object of one's pity and his Nietzschean verdict against the fatal power of the weak resonates with the political ills of this time. The main action is set in 1914 and the months leading up to World War I, pushed on by circumstances and caught between the polarities of his life as an officer in the Austro-Hungarian army and his acquaintance with a wealthy local family, Anton Hoffmiller consents to an engagement with Edith, the crippled daughter who loves him, immediately regretting his assent remorsefully, yet refusing responsibility, he denies the news of his engagement to his comrades. This weakness of character, his selfish and superficial pity for Edith and her father, his fear of making decisions, and his inability of facing the consequences to drive the woman to commit suicide and break her father's heart. Beware of pity. You're going to see a theme. A lot of these uh, have to do with war. Just because I think it's a very interesting topic. I would never want to go to war. Um, but the reasons that people find to start wars, um, the civilians that get wrapped up in it, um, the conditions that are just like so heartbreaking. Um, and like the stories that uh, they tell through like their experiences. I like reading it through a book. Um, I also really like historical movies and like period pieces, but I could read about war and like other time periods all day. Uh, this one is another one that's originally in German, also about World War I, Storm of Steel. One of the most striking accounts of the First World War, uh, Richard Holmes. A memoir of astonishing power, savagery, and ashen lyrics, lyricism, Storm of Steel depicts Ernest Jünger's experience of combat in the German front line, leading raiding parties, defending trenches against murderous British incursions, and simply enduring as shells tore his comrades apart. One of the greatest books to emerge from the catastrophe of the First World War. It illuminates, like no other book, not only the horrors, but also the fascination of a war that made men keep fighting on for four long years. So yeah, and this one's written by someone who, uh, the author fought in World War One. So, again, I really like war books and ones about like periods I don't really know a lot about. I mean, I know a pretty decent amount about World War One, but yeah. The Bridge on the Drina by Ivo Andrik. A vivid depiction of the suffering history has imposed upon the people of Bosnia from the late 16th century to the beginning of World War I. The Bridge on the Drina earned Andrik the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1961, a great stone bridge built three centuries ago in the heart of the Balkans by a Grand Vizier of the Ottoman Empire dominates the setting of Ivo Andrik's novel. Spanning generations, nationalities, and creeds, the bridge stands witness to the countless lives played out upon it. To Radisov, the workman who tries to hinder its construction and its 
is impaled alive on its highest point to the lovely Fata, who throws herself from the parapet to escape a loveless marriage, to Milan, the gambler who risks everything in one last game on the bridge with the devil, his opponent, to Fidun, the young soldier who pays for a moment's spring forgetfulness with his life. War finally destroys the span with it on the last descendant of the family which the Grand Vizier confided the care to his pious bequest, the bridge. He was also a, a Yugoslav diplomat. 1892 to 1975. This one's an outlier. It's not really about war. Uh, Shadow Country by Peter Matheson. Killing Mr. Watson, Lost Man's River, and Bone by Bone. Peter Matheson's great American epic about Everglades sugar planter and notorious outlaw E.J. Watson on the wild Florida frontier at the turn of the 20th century were originally conceived as one vast mysterious novel. Now, in this bold, in this bold new rendering, the thesis has marvelously distilled a monumental work while deepening the insights and motivations of his characters with brilliant rewriting throughout. He was a finalist for National Book Award for at a play in the fields of the Lord. Yeah. Oh, and this one won a National Book Award. So that one's Shadow Country. Next we have Renetsky March by Joseph Roth. The Redetsky March, Joseph Roth's classic saga of a privileged von Strata family, encompasses the entire social fabric of the Austro-Hungarian Empire just before World War I, the author's greatest achievement. The Redetsky March is an unparalleled portrait of a civilization in decline, and as such, a universal story for our times. And he actually fought in the Austro-Hungarian army from 1916 to 1918. The Redetsky March. Um, and these are, other books are hand-me-downs. Last one is a book I'm in the progress of reading, The Overstory. Um, doesn't really fit in with the other ones, but... I really enjoy it. It's basically about, um, it follows like several characters and their stories involving trees. Um, it's kind of a esoteric, holistic kind of book. If you aren't spiritual, you don't really, uh, it's not a book for you. You won't get it. National Book Award winner Richard Powers' 12th novel is a sweeping and passioned work activism and resistance that also is a stunning evocation of a pain to the natural world from the roots to the crown and black to the seeds the overstory unfolds in concentric rings of interlocking fables that range from antebellum new york to the 20th century timber wars of the pacific northwest and beyond there is a world alongside ours, vast, slow, interconnected, resourceful, magnificently inventive, and almost invisible to us. This is a story of a handful of people who learn how to see what the world, that the world and who are drawn up into its unfolding catastrophe. Yeah, really good. I'm going to finish this one, and then I'm going to finish A Little Life. And the rest of the ones I will get to after. Um, I have an account on Goodreads, which is like a book social media site. If you want to see what I'm reading in my progress, uh, follow me there.